Allow, to, allow me to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and uh, we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Good evening, everyone. Kalispedasas. Welcome to our third online seminar this year and the sixth seminar in the 2024 Greek Community of Melbourne History and Culture Seminar Series. And a big welcome to our speaker today, uh, Creek based Dr. Ioannis Limios Segedis. A reminder that next week's seminar will also be uh, an online seminar. We've lost the use of the venue uh, of the Greek Centre due to the um, Comedy Festival uh, taking place at the moment, and I encourage you all to um, attend the show or two. It's um, quite a great uh, program. Um, this, our seminar next week will be by Brisbane based Professor David Pritchard. He'll be speaking on the Athenian funeral oration after Nicole Leroux. Uh, with respect to tonight's seminar, I'd like to thank the sponsor who, who's dedicated to, um, to the memory of George Asprovtas. And I invite you all to become a sponsor of a seminar of your choice. It's only a tax deductible $100, and there's still a few seminars left without a sponsor. Now let's return to tonight's seminar. Uh, the topic being migration as an opportunity the Intergovernmental Committee for European Migration, ISEM, or DEME, the Greek acronym, and Greek transport companies in post-World War II migration to Australia. Greek migration to Australia after World War II was primarily an organised affair between governments. Yes, there might have been a few individuals that jumped ship or entered illegally, but the overwhelming majority of migrants entered via officially sanctioned programmes. Often research in this area tends to focus on a migrant, for example, on push-pull factors, on opportunities for advancement, on the impact of government policies, challenges um, to assimilation, etc. However, uh, the, in the facilitation of these migrant processes, in the management, the mediation and coordination of these migrant flows, there are also opportunities for entities, whether they are individuals or businesses, to realise profits. This is quite an under-researched area. Uh, one such company, um, out of the few that were uh, involved, um, stood out in the process, uh, was Hadris Lines. Um, how did they outmaneuver the competition and dominate the seaways between Greece and Australia? Um, these companies will be the focus of tonight's seminar uh, to be delivered by Dr. Ioannis Limios Segedis. Uh, and a few words about our speaker tonight. Uh, Ioanni sort of um, lives and he's based in Erakli on Crete. Um, he has an MA from the University of Crete. And in 1923, he obtained his PhD from the Department of Political Science and History at the Pantheon University in Athens. Um, the work he'll be presenting today mainly derives from research during his postgraduate studies and he's published several articles uh, along these themes. Um, Ioanni, um, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Australia. Kalispera from Greece. Thank you, Nick. Um, and thank you all for being here. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be with you today, presenting you a piece of my work. To be honest, uh, until recently, I wasn't aware of the history and culture seminars uh, of the Greek community of Melbourne. And when I saw the program of 2024, as well as the previous years, I got excited with all the good work you done there. So thank you, Nick Dallas, for the invitation, as well as for the, your introduction. Um, today, um, today, we will speak regarding state migration policies, international organizations, and passenger ships. Um, as we are about to sail, allow me to tell you that today's presentation is based on archival sources from uh, national archives from Greece, Australia, and the United States, archives from international organizations, the Greek and international press, and personal interviews conducted by me. We will start the presentation by reading an excerpt from a news article of 2016. I quote, 2015 was a year of financial rescue for the shipping companies operating in Northern Aegean, thanks to the transfer of the, uh, from the islands to Attica in northern Greece of hundreds of thousands of refugees and migrants who landed on the opposite coast of Asia Minor. 
Many millions of euros accumulated in the coffers of these companies from chartered contracts from, for transport with the state and also with the tickets that immigrants and refugees paid for, the tran for their transport with both chartered ships and liner ships. In any crisis, the parties involved endure different experiences, and a crisis for some is an opportunity for others. This is what the previous excerpt clearly demonstrates in the case of the Mediterranean refugee crisis in 2015, when about a million of migrants and refugees crossed the sea borders, mainly between Turkey and Greece, and in the vast majority landed in the northern Aegean islands. With the refugees and migrants destined primarily for the northern European countries, the only way to continue their trip was by moving to the Greek mainland and the cheapest way to do so was by sea. This humanitarian crisis was proved as an opportunity for the liner shipping companies operating within Greece to increase their profits. Considering that the tourist and general passenger traffic they served was diminishing due to the refugee and financial crisis, the increasing migrant refugee passenger traffic guaranteed their profitability. Therefore, New shipping companies started their operation on the islands, along with those already in operation and experienced a period of unexpected profitability, which resulted in the creation of a new migration industry in the sector. Such opportunities were also presented after the end of the Second World War, when millions of people decided to migrate or were forced to flee their countries. The core idea is that through the migration process, the production of revenue is achieved for those involved in its facilitation. The means for this revenue are the living, namely the migrants or the human cargo, as the transport sector uses to term the individuals it transports. Thus, human mobility can be examined as commerce. And this commerce was not under humanitarian terms, but business and commercial ones. But Let's have an introduction to the climate of the period after the Second World War, before I proceed, um, when an international discourse for the so-called surplus population or excess population emerged uh, in the Western world, since the rehabilitation of refugees proved to be increasingly difficult. It was believed that the difficulties and this equilibrium created out of the excess population in some Western European countries contributed to the high unemployment and social risk of the societies. As a solution was proposed, the need for systematic exploration um, of opportunities for greater population mobility at the time when overseas countries suffered from lack of workforce to advance their development. Thus, uh, it was promoted the establishment of an agency uh, to handle this task. In the meantime, Cold War was progressively emerging since 1947, and between the two blocs that emerged after the Second World, World War, West and the Soviet Union, uh, there was no agreement regarding the principle of free movement. The agency to undertake this task was the Intergovernmental Committee for European Migration, ISIM, or in Greek, the Media Kivernitiki Epitropi Metanastefsios Ex Evropis, which was established under the initiative of the United States in 1951. ICM did not have any organic connection to any other organization, the United Nations included, and consisted of emigration and immigration countries, as well as sympathizing countries interested in migration out of political, economic, or other incentives. The membership was open only to countries respecting the principle of free movement uh, of persons. Thus, communist member states were excluded, and the new organization was politically unified with democratic member governments, at least initially. ISIM had readily available 12 ships, uh, passenger ships, belonging to a former organization specialized in refugee migration, the International Refugee Organization, IRO and was endowed uh, with $10 million by the United States. Thus, ICM was funded to manage the so-called surplus population existing in parts of Europe and redistributed to all overseas countries of the Western Bloc that were facing lack of labor power of population, 
or, or of population. ICM was mandated to make arrangements for the transport of migrants for whom existing facilities were inadequate and who could not be moved without international assistance to promote the increase of the volume of migration from Europe by providing services in the processing, reception, first placement and settlement of migrants. But the movement of migrants should, as far as possible, uh, be affected by the normal shipping and air transport services. Thus, ICM operated within the framework of the existing agreements signed between its member states, and the migrants were move, moved on regular scheduled sea and air means of transport. In order to support the sustainability through the internationally collected funds that ICM managed. Migration under the auspices of ICM was financially beneficial for the state compared to the bilateral immigration agreements, as well as for the migrants. The relative costs were shared on a tripartite basis between the countries of origin and destination, and ICM, and ICM based on the funds allocated by the United States. In addition, a small percentage was paid by the migrants themselves. During a period of intense uh, lack of available means uh, of transport overseas, ICM chartered vessels and aircraft or bulk booked uh, space in the, in the vessels of passenger shipping liner companies to transport the migrants under its auspices. Um, in 1952-1980, more than 2,800,000 migrants and refugees were transported under ICM while between 1956 and 1980, uh, ICM distributed more than a half a billion dollars to the transport companies participating in its traffic, presenting a steadily increasing transport budget per decade of operations. It is understood that ICM, apart from being an organization that assisted in the handling of part of the population problems of Europe and the Western overseas countries, was also a source for managing and redistributing important funds internationally, primarily towards the transport companies. ICM was one of the largest single purchasers of passenger space on scheduled regular means of transport in the world, especially during the, 96, uh, the 1950s. Furthermore, it had the power to encourage and initiate the establishment of new regular services when they did not exist or were inadequate. You can see from the table here, uh, which offers a better understanding of the revenue in question and with what, would, uh, with what was at stake. Um, there are a lot to be said uh, about the data of this table uh, regarding the cost per mode of transport and how it combined with the wider technological developments in the transport sector especially in the 1960s, or specific migration movements in the 1970s, but I will not stand here in order to save time for the Greek case. Um, Greece, as well as Australia, were among the 16 founding members of ISIM. Uh, in 1952-1980, about 190,000 persons uh, were transferred through ISIM from Greece while Australia received about 640,000 persons through ISIM. Out of them, about 120,000 from Greece. The vast majority until 1973, the last year of Australia's membership in, uh, membership in ISIM. Greece in particular, as a traditional maritime country, had an, op uh, had an important incentive to support uh, the transport companies under the national flag to enlarge their business with ISIM, uh, since their outcomes uh, were inextricably linked with the national economy. The employment of a regular um, overseas route financially mobilizes not only the transport company, but also the wider local and national economy economies where it operates. For example, Hotels, restaurants, retailer shops were established and operated in order to accommodate, feed and supply the migrating, traveling population. These businesses employed staff, paid taxes and were supplied by or supplied other local businesses. In the return traffic of the passenger vessels, they transported tourists, among others, who contributed to the currency reserves of the country by using the services of the affirmation uh, businesses. In addition, the passenger vessels had to be equipped with furniture, food supplies, non-food items, and supported the external trade of the country, among many more. 
The Greek transport companies, uh, the Greek transport interests in the ICM traffic were concentrated in two directions. The North Atlantic, with the presence of the Greek flagged uh, National Hellenic American Line, a subsidiary of home lines owned by Evgenios Evgenidis, and of the Greek line owned by John Wolandris under the Liberian flag, a flag of convenience or of open registry as they are called now. Additionally, and more importantly, Greek transport companies were employed in the Australasian sea routes. Both routes experienced national and international competition from sea and air transport means and sought go governmental and ICM support uh, to face competition. Before I proceed though, I need to remind that between 1951 and 1974, Australia received about 1,200,000 migrants from the United Kingdom and Ireland, and about 340,000 uh, from Italy. This great population outflow, along with those from neighboring countries, resulted in the resurgence of the business interests uh, in the transport sector from these countries towards Australia. Thus, since uh, the end of the Second World War, uh, well-established British and Italian liner shipping companies reinstated the regular service with destinations in Australia and New Zealand. Um, the regular airline, airlines from several countries increased the competition even further by joining the traffic more actively since the mid-1950s. Therefore, when the Greek transport companies endeavoured to participate in the Australasian sea, sea routes, they had to face a consolidated competition. Migration from Greece to Australia was of considerable magnitude uh, in comparison with the general overseas migrations from the country. These data refer to total migration, not only from ICM. More specifically, between 1951 and 1980, around 207,000 migrants arrived in Australia from Greece. The majority of them arrived during the 1960s. Uh, with the end of the White Australia policy, uh, in 1973, and the opening of new migration outlets for Australia from formerly excluded regions like Asia, and in combination with the general decrease of migration from Greece, the Greek migration to Australia decreased substantially in the 1970s. After the end of the Second World War, the Greek flag was first represented uh, in the Greek Australasian sea routes in 1947 as the Hellenic Mediterranean Line, LMS, of the ship owner Yanulatos raised the Greek flag uh, to its passenger vessel Kirinia, Cyrenia, also approaching to Jena. However, the service of this route was rather opportunistic. At the end of 1952, the vessel withdrew for two years due to the low migration rates to Australia, with the company accusing the Greek government of lack of support in view of foreign competition. At the same time, foreign liner shipping companies took the chance and started calling to the Greek ports. The Italian shipping company Sitmar Line advertised the inauguration of, of the approaches by one of its passenger vessels to Piraeus port in the Greek press since the end of 1953 while the British P&O Orient Line advertised the calls of its four passenger vessels to Kalamata port since early 1954. In mid-1954, LMS returned to the Greek-Australian sea traffic, especially because the ICM program to Australia was expanding, also with the general migration traffic towards the country. The vessel received the moral support of the Greek government, something translated into imposition of restriction on the competition, prohibiting the approaches by foreign uh, companies, uh, foreign passenger vessels to the Greek ports since early March 1954. At the same time, Almes secured a contract with ISIM for the transport of its migrants, while the Greek and Australian press campaigned in favor of the company. The Almes operation was so successful that it constituted Cyrenia as the big money maker uh, for its owners, according to ISEM. In 1955, Almes enlarged its presence in the traffic by adding the passenger vessel Tasmania uh, to its fleet, thus attracting further business from ISEM by a contract offered uh, for five voyages. 
and by benefiting by the board uh, by the boarding of the last French soldiers from Saigon on the return traffic. The operation of the of the two LMS vessels withstood competition of the foreign passenger vessels. However, the economic recession in Australia, the progressive decline of its immigration program, the reduction of the available French soldiers from Saigon for the return traffic to Europe, and the problems in the safety and operation of LMS passenger vessels resulted in the final withdrawal of LMS from the Australian sea route in the end of 1956, as well as the end of the Greek flag representation until the, the end of 1959. Consequently, the general migration transport market uh, offered a way out to foreign competitors for most two Italian liner shipping companies, Sitmar Line, Cogidar Line, and Lloyd Triestino, which called the Piraeus port and the British PO uh, Orient Line, whose vessels approach Navarino port on a regular basis. All vessels also embarked uh, Asian migrants. In addition, the airline companies expanded their presence in Greece and their own connected Athens and Australian airports, such as uh, uh, such airlines included Qantas, Boac, British Overseas Airways Co Corporation, uh, Pan American and Air India since 1956, and KLM Airlines from 1957. The idea of relaunching the Greek Australian sea route was expressed towards the end of 1957 by John Latsis, a Greek ship owner who, according to Axiom, had no experience in passenger traffic, nor a suitable passenger ship for the trade yet. The interest of Latsis mobilized wider spectrums of the Greek maritime community in 1958. The officials of the National Hellenic American Line met in June with the Axiom administration in Geneva, informing on the request by the Greek government to employ the vessels Queen Frederica for two voyages to Australia. In December 1958, Latsis informed Nysim that he had purchased two passenger vessels with the intention of placing them under the Greek flag on the Greek Australian sea route. Each vessel would sail every 40 days from Piraeus and calls to Maltese ports were foreseen. Latsis would allocate more than two-thirds two of the vessel's passenger capacity to Nysim, thus would allocate uh, more, uh, sorry, so, so he would secure standard revenue from each uh, voyage. Almez would undertake the operation of Lazi service, considering the experience of the former in the route and its cooperation with the international organization, as ICM was. Lazi's venture uh, enjoyed the support of the Greek government, which in turn requested influence and sympathy from the ICM and the Prime Minister promised unlimited governmental support to the ship owner who scheduled the first voyage for December 1959. Meanwhile, in July 1959, the Chandris, Chandris brothers announced to the ICM administration their intention to establish a regular liner shipping service between Piraeus and Australia through a mixed cargo, a passenger cargo vessel named Patrice that they had already purchased and would place under the Greek flag. Sanders requested the ICM administration to meet and discuss together before the latter negotiated a contract with Lazis or any other ship owner. According to the press of the time, Sanders requested the Greek, um, the Greek government exclusive, exclusive and active moral support with ICM and the conference. Keep in mind that. Um, seeking the transport of Greek migrants and cargo to Australia for their passenger vessel. They also stressed that they would not accept the government to offer any material or moral support or credit to any other company, a condition which would create unfair competition and harm their business. Therefore, the, the Chandris brothers made the terms known under which their company would conduct business and how they would tack competition. At that time, the competition between Lattice and Chandris also started involving the Greek press uh, with the production of articles from center wing newspapers of the opposition of the time in support of Lattice and of the Greek right wing maritime press 
with articles referring to the unpreparedness of Lazi's uh, plans. Nevertheless, in August 1959, the Greek government accepted the petitions of both ship owners for their registration uh, under the Greek flag for transoceanic voyages to Australia in accordance with the privileges of law degree 2687 of 1953, which offered financial and administrative advantages to Greek-owned businesses established abroad in case they were transferred within the Greek territory. Regarding the transport sector, this law was translated in an eff into an effort for, of revival of the Greek shipping registry with a return under the national flag of vessels owned by, Greek, uh, by Greeks abroad. With the routing of Chandris passenger vessels in the Piraeus, uh, Australia searoute, Lagis changed his plans and contemplating the routing of his vessel from Western European port to Australia by also approaching, to, uh, approaching in Greece. Eventually, even this plan uh, never materialized. Chandris Greek Australian line, GAL, was the only liner shipping company under the Greek flag in the route which initially organized sailings every two months under the passenger of vessel Patrice. ICM contracted the Chandra shipping company uh, for the transport of ICM migrants. The first voyage of Patrice took place in December 1959. The day before the trip, a sanctification ceremony was organized in the presence of the prime minister and members of the government, among many more officials, giving a national dimension in the operation of the Chandra Shipping Company. The existence and operation of ISIM was instrumental for the establishment of the Greek-Australian line of Chandris, a shipping company that based its operation from Greece on the signing of ISIM contracts. An officer, of the, uh, an officer at the Greek-Australian line since, uh, uh, since January 1960 recollects, and I quote, the migrant traffic from Greece to Australia increased. Anthony Chandris got the blessing in the agreement of ICM in, in Geneva, considering that the new shipping line had to receive its approval. Thus, Anthony Chandris secured the support of ICM, and therefore we had this great outflow to Australia. It needs to be revealed here that the Greek liner shipping companies that actually engaged in the service of the sea route from, Austra from Greece to Australia were not newcomers, in the migrant refugee transport, nor in their cooperation with an international organization. Starting from, from Yanulatos, uh, through his shipping companies, LMS and China Hellenic Lines, he had been participating in the refugees transfers under the International Refugee Organization, IRO, since 1949, from Greece and Italy to Australia. Same applies for the Tandris brothers, who less successfully, uh, through the company Salt and Steam Sea, um, uh, charted two passenger vessels to IRO in 1948 for the transport of refugees from Europe to the east coast of South America and to Australia. However, mechanic the mechanical problems faced on both passenger vessels did not allow to receive uh, longer engagement in IRO refugee traffic. Lastly, Roulandries. Uh, vessel near Elas was also con uh, contracted by IRO in 1949 for the transport of refugees from Genoa to Australia. With the knowledge acquired from the cooperation with IRO, Jan Lados and Sandri School acknowledged the opportunities emerging out of the refugee migrant traffic under ISEM. They had been familiar with the operation of international organizations as well as with the technical uh, operation of a migrant refugee shipping route. Therefore, when their wider business interests correlated and could be combined with the scope of ICM, they seized the opportunity and benefited from the ICM migrant traffic. However, the interest of several shipping companies in the Greek Australian Sea route in 1958-59 was not incidental. It can be seen as the result of a combination of wider national and international maritime policies that affected the decision of the Greek shipping companies in registering their vessels in the Greek shipping registry. Starting from the Greek policies, we need to keep in mind that there were privileges for shipping companies like Claude Degree 
1880 of 1951 and uh, 2687 of 1953, which provided financial taxation and administrative privilege specifically to the shipping companies that, the, that brought the vessels acquired abroad under the Greek flag. Meanwhile, during 1958, a hostile environment had been created for the vessels under flags of convenience, heavily affecting the Greek shipping companies, which preferred them. Towards the end of 1958 also, the first international boycott against the flags of convenience was imposed, resulting in the decrease of these vessels' profitability. Therefore, in 1958, from, for some shipping companies, hoisting the Greek flag on their vessels seemed more advantageous in combination with a more attractive system formulated since the first half of, of the 1950s. These circumstances uh, resulted in the explosion of interest from the Greek shipping companies regarding the revival of the Greek Australasian passenger sea routes. More specifically now on the Chandris lines, with the establishment of Chandris passenger shipping line, it met with the fierce competition of the Australian New Zealand Passenger Conference and secondarily the Australian New Zealand Cargo Conference. Specifically, the booking agents of the Passenger Conference member lines were instructed to blacklist GAL by not booking passengers on Patrice until the berths uh, had been filled. Furthermore, agents were prohibited to advertise or display any favorable publicity of GAL services. The agents that disobeyed those, these directives uh, would lose the representation of the conference members' lines, an important threat, uh, as the conference vessels handled 60% of the whole passenger traffic from Australia to Europe and 90% from Sydney. The same practices were also followed by the cargo conference, prohibiting the loading of patries uh, with any freight. Um, the Greek government intervened in support of GAL through the consular ports authorities in London by pressuring the representatives of the reacting foreign companies, uh, shipping companies operating in Greece, by complaining to the Australian government and by bringing the matter to the attention of the Organization for European Economic Cooperation. The blacklisting of GAL was discussed at the, uh, the Australian Parliament. A member of the parliament heavily accused the conference of being guilty of the most blatant and restrictive trade practices and for discrimination, asking the government to take action against the monopoly control of the passengers of the conference and to respect the governmental policy of free enterprise. From his side, the Australian Minister of uh, for Trade supported the operation of GAL and recognized it as an opportunity for the enhancement of trade between Australia and Greece, apart from the migrant traffic. However, he indicated the government's inability to oppose British interests uh, within the conference. Feeling that the government was unable to intervene in a matter of the private, of the private sector, the result of this competition on the, of the conferences were that Patrice would embark about 160 passengers only uh, on its first trip from Australia to Greece and about 400 tons of freight. Sandris visited Australia and requested that the Greek community and its press in Australia support Patrice. In addition, in order to mitigate the effects of the embargo, alongside with uh, refrigerated meat and, cargo, and other cargo uh, trade agreements made, the, uh, the Sandris organized an advertisement campaign in Australia for the development of tourist traffic offering to each of his passengers three days of hospitality in Greece. Um, within a year from the selling of Patrice, uh, Sandris bought, the, uh, passenger, uh, bought another passenger vessel, Britain, uh, which sailed from Southampton in, the, Southampton in the United Kingdom, thus inaugurating a new service, the Europe Australia Line, and competed with the British Conference members line, member lines uh, within their own territory by offering fares about 15 to 20 percent lower than the conference's fares. In the following years, the effects of the embargo eased, and in 1962, uh, the passenger conference lifted the prohibition um, of ticket selling to the travel agents in Australia, 
with the support of ISIM, the easing of the effects of the embargo and the increase of the Greek-Australian migrant traffic, 1961-66, Gull stabilized its operation. Within a brief period, Gull enlarged its fleet by four more passenger vessels that were directed from Southampton to Australia with calls also to you know, in Piraeus. In the field of domestic competition, Chandris did not let other competitors undermine Gull supremacy uh, in the Greek Australian sea routes. Therefore, when Ladzis announced his intention to the press to schedule a, a series of voyages of Australia uh, to Australia starting in November 1964 by the passenger vessel Mariana Fourth, Chandris organized a press campaign characterizing the selling of Ladzis vessels a vessel as illegal, considering that only his vessel retained the right for the service of Greek Australia Seward. Latsis subjected the, to the accusation and reconfirmed his will to perform the voyage at any rate, um, as there were no legal obstacles. Therefore, he transferred the matter to the legal counselor of the Greek Ministry of Mercantile Marine, uh, who decided in Latsis' favor. This, though, should not be considered as coincidence as the governmental change in 1963-64 with the central left-wing Greek government overturned the status quo of the business and political world of the time. Latsis and the Prime Minister Yorgos Papandreou both originated from the Peloponnese and both maintain important business and political links with the Middle East. These men and their descendants develop a relationship also in the years to follow. However, Within a few days, it was announced through the Greek press that the, that both shipping companies would cooperate for an extraordinary selling of the largest vessel handled by Gal, uh, the Chandris company. For this voyage, the ship's funnel was spent in the Chandris colors. And according to the ICM, the Gal purchased Lazis vessel uh, with the intention to resell it to Lazis upon the vessel's arrival to Australia. The end of the Greek flag um, in the Greek in the passenger sea routes between Greece and Australia came in December 1977, when Tandris surrendered uh, in the competition of aircraft and focused entirely on the cruise business in the Atlantic, Caribbean, Pacific, Indian, and Indonesian oceans, a market which had joined uh, since 1961 as a complementary activity. But what we can keep uh, from all the above is that the establishment and operation of the Greek Australasian Sea Route was directly linked with the assurances from the side of ICM for the provision of migrant passengers. Almes, Ladzis, and Tandris sought the support of ICM before the selling of the vessels. When the ICM support diminished, the liner shipping companies faced viability problems, as happened in 1956 in the case of LMS services. Conversely, when the ICM migrant traffic from Greece to Australia increased, it was quite the reason for the establishment of new shipping companies, as the Chandris brothers successfully did. Therefore, a development role can be attributed to ICM, since its operation made the re-establishment re of the Greek Australasian sea route possible, and consequently, the activation of wider economic markets. The support of the uh, Greek government was also sought by the interested liner shipping companies, but in direct assurances and its moral support was the best that they could receive. Kinship and business interests, uh, uh, relations uh, with members of the, uh, the government were important tools for the indirect support of the business interests. In the case of Chandris, the Minister of Mercantile Marine in 1965-66 of the central wing government was a relative of the ship owners, and the minister's brother was a close associate of the Tandri Shipping Company. Likewise, Lodzis had developed close links with the Yorgos Papandreou administration, which favored his business interests. The governmental support towards the Greek flagged shipping companies was translated into an attempt to control and manage the market by reducing foreign and domestic competition, by securing the passenger lot through pressure over ICM and political representation in foreign entities. The Greek government's 
acted protectively towards rural mess and sundries, in line also with a wider national policy targeting uh, the attraction of the foreign uh, Greek capital into the motherland. The incident of the embargo by the conferences is indicative of the creation and protection of monopolies and of the practices they adopted to forestall competition. Sanders, though, increased the opposition by raising the matter on a political level through the respective governments, on an entrepreneurship level by making agreements to increase the company's traffic load, and on a public level through part of the Greek and foreign press for indirect pressure and support of the claims. In the end, Sanders prevailed over competition by combining, apart from cargo, migrant and tourist traffic uh, from Greece and Europe to Australia, marking the next day in the passenger uh, traffic by sea. Concluding this representation, we can argue that the advantages offered uh, by the Greek government, uh, the law degree um, 2687 in, uh, of 1953 and subsequent laws, in combination with the international maritime uh, climate after 1958, were instrumental for, in the revival of the passenger traffic by sea towards Australia. Thus, migration can be recognized as the medium for the success of this policy and the re-establishment of these passenger sea routes. However, whenever gaps in the Greek transport market were identified, they were easily covered by foreign competition. Uh, the direct imposition of restrictions in the access of the foreign transport companies from the Greek ports was increasingly difficult in an era of trade liberalization. Therefore, competition between the companies prevailed and the pressure towards ICM was intense. The ship, the ship owners consisted of an, 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 entrepreneur, an entrepreneurial group highly advantaged by the governmental policies in Greece since 1953, considering that their business endeavors on an international level were set as one of the prerogatives of the Greek state for its financial development. The return of Greek capital acquired abroad into the motherland um, was one of the top priorities of the Greek policy, uh, the Greek uh, governments until at least 1980. Thus, the business mentality of the ship owners favoring the diversification of their businesses by investing in various financial and business sectors was what attracted the Greek governments in their effort to please the ship owners' interests, since their collateral interests um, affected larger, larger parts of Greek economy. Therefore, uh, the Greek ship owners had an increased negotiation power over the Greek community. As in the 19th century, century and the first half of the 20th century, the competition between the transport companies, not only in the case of foreign companies, but as well as in the Greek case, was not necessarily governed by values of free competition. Cases of subversion and direct and indirect competition were noticed in all ICM destinations. The migration business created out of uh, ICM's operation enhanced competitiveness. But it also created opportunities for the transport companies, as seen especially in the case of Greek Australasian sea routes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yanni, uh, for that sort of interesting presentation. And I'm sure there'll be a few questions from the audience, but I might just kickstart the questioning. Um, no doubt those ships that plied the trade between uh, Greece to Australia, they weren't sort of newly built ships, they were repurposed ships. Um, were, were they former troop carriers during World War II? Um, what, what lines did they serve beforehand, before they became migrant ships? And, um... the, the companies, are, the Greek companies? Yes, that's correct, yeah. The, the... Well, regarding El ships, um, as this already discussed, they were uh, they were supporting the transfer of refugees under the IRO program, uh, refugees from Greece, Italy to Australia, as well as other countries and destinations of uh, were they, IRO. Were they, were they new ships, or they were repurposed? They were in some other capacity beforehand, and they repurposed them. 
they came in Greece as new ships. Um, they were purchased for this uh, for this uh, for this role as well as Patrice. Yeah, so okay. previously the, um, they they've been with other companies uh, for mainly passenger traffic, but some they were also renovated and from cargo transfer. I mean, Alme ships. They were changed um, the the purpose of it, the, how they use it. So. Initially, some uh, uh, passenger vessels of LMS, I think Cyrenia, uh, was also used for cargo transport. Okay, and you. then was renovated according to the IRO uh, directives on how they can be used for, pass for passenger traffic. Um, some other well-known ships on that route were the um, Elenis and I think Queen Federica as well. Can you say something about those ships? Some... Yes. Queen Frederica was owned by the National um, Hellenic American Line, and it was um, in the traffic from Greece to uh, Canada as well as uh, the United States. It was used by ICM, um, so, uh, considering that they had also migration to the United States as well as to Canada, uh, but and. In 1958, it is an interesting that it was used also for the Australian traffic because the Greek government, due to the climate that we discussed earlier in 1958, wanted to re-establish the Greek, uh, the Greek um, passenger traffic to Australia. So what they did is um, they, they used these, these uh, vessel Queen Frederica for uh, in in this example uh, in order to see the operation of the Greek Australian line and regarding Elenis uh, as well as Australis Vretanis uh, uh, and Britain were vessels that were purchased uh, and were used by Chandris line after 1962 and up to 1977, and uh, when the last sail to, when the last voyage under the Greek flag was in Australia. And some of the Australis also was the biggest ve passenger vessels in the Greek registry, under the Greek registry, shipping registry. And it was quite a um, discussion in the Greek maritime press, as well as in generally in Greece and in the passenger traffic. And Queen Frederica and the National Hellenic American Line was also purchased in the mid-1960s from Chandris. So he was operating two, two lines, one towards the, the, uh, the northern uh, Atlantic and one to Australia. But we need to remember that b both these traffics were not so, uh, had not the same uh, power. I mean, regarding uh, the migration, uh, the 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 flow to Australia uh, was mainly a migrant traffic, but the 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 passenger tra the, the traffic to Northern America was mainly tourist traffic, sure. and ICM had only a part of uh, the traffic. So their vessels, uh, the shipping companies, were not so much engaged engaged. Uh, with the ice and traffic towards the North America, but towards Australia, they depend on the ice. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll go to questions from the floor. Um, one of the short questions Did Qantas participate in the ice and migrant traffic? I think you said they, they were involved. In... Yes, and thank you for this question. Um, yes, of course, they participated, but in the 1960s. Um, in the 1950s, uh, as, uh, Qantas had not the, was not ready yet uh, due to its equipment and the aircraft that it had to participate actively uh, in the migrant traffic. But um, in the 1958-59, they, uh, the, they entered the Zeb era. So Australia wanted to... Um, uh, to take advantage of it and use this uh, aircraft in order to profit and 
also from the migration traffic. But uh, we need to keep in mind also that Australia had a different position in ICM uh, and different uh, power, negotiation power uh, in regards with other countries, uh, including Greece. Um, Australia was uh, the second financial um, contributor to the ICM work and the first country or uh, the first immigration country receiving migrants. So when Qantas was ready to participate in the ICM traffic, uh, Australia negotiated uh, an agreement with ICM in order 70 to 80 percent of the general uh, uh, charter flights to Australia to be under the Qantas uh, flights. So okay. they impose the needs. Yes. And, and, and in all allocating those travel <coughs> travel options for migrants, um, the Greek government, how would they choose which migrants travel by, um, by air as opposed to ship? What were the criteria? Mm -hmm. Well, initially, uh, the Greek government wanted to uh, an ICM. Uh, uh, I mean, the the, mem the member states of ICM in the 1950s wanted to the migrants to travel by sea, and uh, a sort of group was uh, established within the maritime countries, uh, which tried to impose uh, their uh, transport preferences. They were consider the ship uh, to be as the most humanitarian traffic uh, passenger uh, uh, mode of transport because the migrants had the opportunity to digest that they were migrating, the idea of migration, and also to be prepared uh, because uh, during this uh, voyage they were also taking place. Um, uh, uh, language courses, and they were they had the time in order to get prepared for migration. But behind this, we have the business interest because Greece, Italy, as well as other countries, were mainly maritime countries. So their interest was in to support the scheduled regular lines, pa uh, passenger lines that were transporting. So in the 1950s, um, the migrants from Greece, uh, I'm only I'm talking regarding the ice and traffic, we're traveling um, mainly by sea in case of families and single men and uh, vulnerable people uh, cases, uh, which were elderly people, all medical cases, uh, uh, people facing medical problems or single domestic women. Uh, single women who were uh, to be employed as domestic uh, personnel in Australia, they were preferred to travel by air. However, um, the Greek government um, had a rigid policy uh, regarding the air traffic, and this was also uh, imposed toward, towards the Greek government by the Chandris because um, uh, uh, Sanders wanted to monopolize the migrant transport traffic uh, from Greece to Australia. Um, and the Greek government also uh, imposed, imposed restrictions um, in the, uh, or for the uh, charter flights of ICM. So when Sanders had the opportunity to transfer these uh, migrants who were scheduled to, tra to travel uh, from with an airline with uh, with charter flight to Australia through ISIM, they cancelled the flight, and this population was travel was transferred to Chandris. Or true. when Chandris um, uh, decided that he could uh, have an additional um, uh, voyage through a passenger vessel of his own. Um, then he the, the flights well well again again were transferred uh, were cancelled and transferred this population to Chandris, and we also had the refusal of landing rights to airlines. Okay. Um, next question is from Steve Bacalas. It's sort of two questions in one. Um, why does the Greek shipping sector stand out in a very competitive environment and has a global outlook compared to other sectors in Greece? 
That's the first part. And the second part is um, Latsis Kandris, Hulandris. Were they also active in the ownership of Greek media during that time? Mm -hmm. Well, regarding the first question, uh, is a matter of what maritime trade we speak. Um, definitely the Greek ship owners were not so actively participating in the passenger traffic. They were in cargo and uh, cargo traffic and with the use of uh, um, uh, petroleum, diesel, and mainly from the United States. Onassis is a very well-known example. And the Greek ship owners um, were heavily using the flags of convenience, as I mentioned. The flags of convenience is, uh, were uh, financial paradises, if you want to say so. And oh, actually, I'm, I do not know if we are aware of the Greek flag, of the flags of convenience. So I will say a few words. The flag uh, for every ship, in order to be registered within a flag within a state a, 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 a registry, a national registry, they need to have a link between the ownership and the flag. And the, yes, so. What the uh, the flags of convenience did it was that they they break the li this link, and they were accepting the registration of shipping companies and vessels uh, under their flag, and they offered um, uh, financial tax uh, ta lower taxation, a uh, more uh, lenient um, uh, administrative procedures and they restricted they, they had not restrictions regarding the crew uh, of uh, the, the the vessels uh, because according to the greek registry they had to hire greek uh, greek novels uh, greek crew. so they took advantage of the liberian panamanian uh, uh, flag and they also had the support of uh, of the maritime climate of the period. Um, regarding the media, um, on this period that we were discussing, um, I would say no. But thereafter, uh, of course, uh, regarding the media, if Ulandris, Almes, and uh, Jan Latos and Latsis uh, and Sandris owned um, media, I would say no. But they had important links with the Greek press and the maritime press. Uh, of the time and international press because they supported uh, with lavish advertisements um, uh, the, the operation of this company of this press of these newspapers. So, and also uh, they were not only in the in the in the shipping sector. Chandris, uh in the years to come uh, had also um, uh, uh, how we call it. Um, uh, in Salamis Island, they were renovating uh, uh, vessels. Uh, I don't know. I do not remember. Nafpiu, yeah. Shipyard, shipyard, yeah. Shipyard, yeah. And also a chain, a chain of hotels. Um, he was um, uh, employed in industry as well as the import and sale of cars. Gulandris had. Um, had an experience of uh, decades in sea, and Evgenius Evgenidis, as we discussed, had also another big uh, shipping company, Homelands, which was active uh, in all the all the world. So until this time, I would say no. In, until the 1960s, they did not have um, ownership of press, uh, but thereafter they were engaged also in this activity. Um, there is a question from um, Georgia Pelizis. Is it true that Greek ship owners do not pay taxes in line with other industries? Um, I, I suppose um, they are facilitated. The, there have been incentives to Greek ship owners to transfer their vessels from flags of convenience to Greece. And I suppose that probably comes with lower taxation. So uh, I presume that's the case. Is that correct, Yanni? Uh, it is correct, and especially the law degree of 1953 offered 
great opportunities and great incentives for the uh, Greek ship owners to transfer their vessels to Greece uh, under the Greek registry because um, their collateral activities uh, and the economies that they they activated um, were more important for the Greek uh, for the Greek governments were equally important with the payment of high taxes that they did not ask from the ship owners. Um, I've got a question from Elizabeth Yatakis um, regarding Sabina Airlines. I think that's actually a Belgian airline. Um, were they participating in the ISIN process as well? Or yes. Were they one of the carriers? It, it, yes. yes, and uh, certainly it was a Belgian governmental airline. And the uh, the interest so the interesting part here is that Belgium was not an emigration country. It was not uh, regarding the um, participation in ISIM. It was not also an immigration country regarding the participation of ISIM because, of course, uh, uh, European migrants were trans uh, were moving to Belgium in order to work in the mines. But the main um, uh, reason for Belgium to participate in ISIM was the, the economic incentive that they had. And one of those was the, uh, the participation of uh, the transport companies, specifically Sabina, to the, uh, to the, um, transport tra uh, to the migrant transport traffic of ISIM. So uh, Sabina was not so much competitive um, regarding the offers that the, the bids that they had on the bid processes that ICM uh, followed in order to select uh, an airline to participate in the traffic. But they they tried and they had flights uh, within, the, um, in, uh, within Europe in case of the relocation of refugees from one country to another uh, as the first asylum uh, country before the final resettlement to an overseas country, country, and some flights were also directed to Australia, but in the 1960s. Okay, um, so question of Vicky Lambropoulou, I don't fully understand, but was there um, or are there any with any advocacy services in regards to uh, these transport options? <coughs> hmm. Well. Uh, Advocacies from ISIM, or yeah, that could be a very broad term. I think so I'm, I'm not not quite sure what she's um, implying well, there. And, uh, yeah, um, what I could respond if I respond to this question that I'm not really aware of. of so, yeah. um, is that um, ISIM was not advertising the migration offers that they had because they couldn't, but they they organized um, ex uh, campaigns uh, through the um, uh, non, uh, the prefectures, uh, the municipalities, and they also visiting other um, areas in order to register migrants. Um, they had access to the press, but regarding announcements um, of opportunities uh, or uh, in order to face the migration propaganda, uh, for example, if someone uh, on a newspaper and a local newspaper advertised that they represent uh, ICM, um, they intervened through the ministry as well as with press announcement to say the, the, the process of being registry, registering um, in order to, to move to another country. Um, so in this way, they also advertising how, somehow advertising how the, a, a migrant could benefit it from migration through ISIM. Um, uh, but if, there, if I did not understand the question, please write again. Okay. Oh, cool. okay. I think we might bring things so close. We sort of passed the hour. Uh, Yanni, um, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Best of luck with any sort of future research. And um, hopefully one day we'll see you um, in Australia as well. Okay. Certainly. Um, it was a pleasure. Bye, bye everyone.